This is the You Show Podcast. Back to two. Huskins, a shot right on. McCurvey scores on the backhand. The fourth line hems in the Oilers, and McCarthy has his first NHL goal. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome in to the You Show Podcast. I'm Chris Trapped, along with Ben Gesselson of the Des Moines Buccaneers. And I don't know why I'm even doing the intro. I'll just let him start because it's a buck. John McCarthy, longtime AHLer, great hockey guy, just a great human being, as most of the people we interview from the USHL are. But here you go, Ben. Here's one of your bucks. Let me just say the Des Moines Buccaneers are the single greatest junior hockey organization <laughs> that has ever been born. <laughs> there we go. That, that'll really make the owners happy. Uh, no, and, and with all due respect to everybody else, I mean, obviously I love the Bucs, but th- this interview, not only for what we talked about, but just the, the way it went and how, uh, how courteous John was with us, how much he truly enjoyed talking about this was a blast for me. And, and you mentioned it all around great guy in John McCarthy and has had a really interesting career for a guy that, yes, played some NHL time, but spent the majority of his career in the AHL and, and played a long time in the AHL. But getting into going to Pyeongchang and being, to, being a part of the U.S. Olympic team after the NHL pulled out of something that he never probably thought he would get to do in his career. And uh, we get into talking about what I really loved about it was talking about how to survive, right? Like only the 1% of the 1% is going to really make it <clears throat> to that top of the peak in the NHL. So he's a guy that learned, okay, what can I do for my team here? What can I do for my team here? And that's something that I think younger hockey players need to hear because only a small percentage of, of hockey players are going to get to do exactly what they want to do at every level of hockey if they want to move on. And, and so I think there's a lot of good tidbits in here from John for players to listen to and think, okay, how can I take this and utilize this in my game today? So I'm excited about it. Clearly, and my voice is ramped up. Yeah. We got bucks in the building. Let's go. Arr. <laughs> Arr. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On guard. <laughs> but, I mean, he's a, a, you, I say this loosely, a relatively unknown guy in the hockey world outside yeah. true hockey purists, right? Like if you're a casual hockey fan who lives in the Midwest or the East, well, not, not even the Northeast, you know, it depends on that because he's mm-hmm. a Boston guy and he played in Worcester forever. But like just, you know, you're a casual hockey fan. You're not going to know this guy's name, but he has accomplished so much in hockey. And he's accomplished so much in hockey without being an overly skilled player. So like, if you can't look at this guy as a kid or a, even a USHL player and realize that there's more to the game than toe drags and sellies, then like you're, you're mistaken. You might not make it. Like there's a time and point in your career where you need to look at yourself and know what you are. And maybe you're not Connor McDavid. And he did that early and he's made a good career. And don't think if you play in the AHL your whole career, you're not going to make any money because yeah. you will. <laughs> yeah. I end AHL guys, especially if you're on a two way deal or even a one way with an NHL club, you're making really good money. You know, it's the second best hockey league in the world. I don't care what they say about the KHL and all that fun stuff. But, I mean, the, the high-end guys in the AHL make good money. So, don't let that fool you. So, I mean, he has a niche, and he made it work. And it was an incredible interview from an incredibly humble and hardworking guy. Let's get to it. John McCarthy of the San Jose Sharks, the San Jose Barracuda, and former Des Moines Buccaneer. <laughs> Time now to hear from our guest on today's episode of the You Show podcast. We have a former member of the San Jose Sharks, longtime captain of their affiliate team in the AHL, the San Jose Barracuda, a national champion with the Boston University Terriers, and last but certainly not least, a member of the 0405 Des Moines Buccaneers in the USHL, John McCarthy. John, pleasure to have you on with us here today. How are you on this fine day of quarantine? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm, I'm at home in uh, Boston, Boston area. It's unseasonably warm this past week, so we're trying to stay cool. But uh, other than that, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. So you had quite a season this year, a lot of changes for you. We'll get to that. But speaking of changes, we're all in the midst of some crazy changes right now. What has life looked like for you in the midst of obviously, especially being in Boston, lockdown and being very social distant? 
Yeah, it's been it's been crazy. You know, the season ended abruptly, I think is the best way to put it um, in mid-March. And, you know, I was out in California um, on the coaching side of things. And uh, I'm sure we'll get into that later. But um, as I said, the season ended and I stuck around there for a little while, just trying to feel it out and see, you know, nobody really knew when things were going to be coming back. And um, once the picture kind of got clearer that, you know, things were going to be a while before they got back to normal, uh, my wife and I came back. Uh, we have a, a home here in Charlestown, Mass. Um, so we came back here and, and moved back into our condo here. And we've just been waiting things out from here and, and waiting for direction. And, uh, you know, the NHL took a little step the other day with the 2014 playoff. And uh, it's exciting that there's kind of a little bit of momentum, a little bit of planning going on. Um, to, to, to get the game back going. As someone affiliated with the NHL, as long as you've been affiliated with it, what did you make of the announcement and how everything was handled? Um, like I said, I, I thought it was great. You know, I, I think it's, it's a positive that, you know, everything is obviously pending any sort of, you know, data or scientific reasons. But, uh, you know, I think it's great that there's some planning stages going on and there's a, there's a concrete plan in place that's an encouraging sign to me. Um, unfortunately, the Sharks were, were not one of the 24 teams um, included, but, uh, you know, it, it, it gives us an opportunity to kind of take a look back at this year and, and reflect and figure out ways that we can get better that, uh, you know, we'll be back in that picture for next season whenever that happens. We've hit the current events. We're here to talk about you and your career. I want to, even though you're in Boston right now, take us all back to, to the Boston area growing up there. You played at St. John's Prep before you made your way to Des Moines. And I, we always like to start with this question because we get a lot of different answers. And the question is, how on the radar or off the radar was the USHL for you at that time coming into your junior eligibility? Was it always a part of the plan or did it kind of come out of left field for you? Completely left field. If we're being completely honest, I didn't even – no, it existed. Um, that, that would have been 2004. Um, you know, the internet wasn't as prominent as it is now. Uh, you know, I had heard about it, I guess, a little bit. Um, what happened was, I, as you said, I was at St. John's Prep. I was playing hockey there. The, the high school hockey season in Massachusetts, you play 20 games a season. That's it. So um, I had been talking with Boston University, and um, I actually ended up committing there. But But one of the precursors to my commitment was that they wanted me to play a year of junior hockey because not only did I only play the 20 uh, ho hockey high school games, I was also playing football at the time as well. So I missed out on all those fall leagues, all kind of the, the prep leagues that a lot of guys in this area play in. I wasn't able to play in. So they said, you know what, we need you take take a year out there, you know, mature, get a little stronger, get a little bigger, you know, play against some better competition. Um, and then you can come in in the fall. And that's, that's what ended up happening. But to answer your question, until they told me about it, I, I was very unfamiliar with the USHL in general. I got to go off script for a second because I got to scratch this itch. John McCarthy, the football player, what position, what were you known for on the gridiron? I was a quarterback, actually, believe it or not. Um, we had a very strong team my junior year. We were actually nationally ranked. We had a lot of good players go on to play big. Compared to, this is the thing, we were in Massachusetts high school football. That's the thing to remember. We were nationally ranked, but there were probably, I think we were 10th, but there were probably 10 teams in Florida that could have beat us. But we had a lot of higher profile, you know, players. We had one kid go to Notre Dame, a couple go to Vanderbilt. So for that reason, we were propped up a little bit. But I loved football. I thought there was a lot. I think it's, I'm a big proponent of guys playing different sports growing up, not just playing hockey. I think athletically you develop, but the other side of things that a lot of people don't realize is the, the, the hockey players that tend to succeed are always the best player on their teams, right? So if you're playing other sports, maybe you know what it's like to not necessarily be the best player on your team and you learn to become a better teammate and, and it, it matures you socially. And I, I've, I've always been a big fan of guys you know, not focusing just on hockey, getting out there, playing different sports, trying to meeting new people, trying different things. I think it, it only leads to good things for you. So Pats then, is that the, the big team for John McCarthy? Yeah, probably not a very popular uh, opinion, but yes, I've always been a very big Patriots fan. I just sad to see Tom Brady leave, but that's life. All good things come to an end. Are you going to root for the, the Bucks now? Or is there a little bit of something there you want them to do well? 
Well, they're in the NFC, so that's that's doable. I wouldn't say root. I'm going to watch. I'm curious to see. Well, now Gronk's back too. So I, I'm curious to see how things go. You know, the Pats are going with the young quarterback. Um, you know, Belichick knows what he's doing. So I just got to have faith. All of us other football fans, much lesser teams, are definitely losing a lot of sleep over Brady leaving the Patriots and all the tough years you guys had to slug your way through out in Boston, uh, dealing with all the, of course, terrible seasons the Patriots had. So yeah. really tough, tough day for you, John, for sure. <laughs> um, concern, yeah, feel bad for you. <laughs> Speaking of football, you got to Iowa and probably got to learn a little bit about the Cyhawk rivalry between Iowa State and Iowa, but you also got to learn about the Des Moines Buccaneers and the program that was there. And you were in the midst of really a heyday type era of the Buccaneers. Talk about you were on the precursor of obviously a Clark Cup championship in 2006. You were at BU at the time, but that 04 05 season, some good players on that club, some players that were a big part of that 06 Clark Cup run. Talking about Trevor Lewis, the guy that stands out the most. But when you remember getting to Des Moines, when you remember getting to Buccaneer Arena, might have been KGGO Arena at the time, actually. But what do you remember about being kind of your first impressions about Iowa and the Des Moines area? Yeah, you know, I, I had never really spent a whole lot of time in the Midwest. And, uh, you know, there was a summer uh, kind of development camp or evaluation camp or something. So that was the first time I came out. And uh, my first impression was that it was very flat. I was not used to seeing that flat of terrain. Um, but as far as, you know, the hockey part, I, I walking into the rink for the first time, I still remember it. You know, high school hockey, Massachusetts, it's not, not like Minnesota high school hockey. It's not widely attended. Um, so, you know, there was, the, the rink was almost full just for, I think it was a tryout camp. It was, the place was sold out. So the enthusiasm that the area has for, for the Bucks, um, you know, that was the first thing that stood out to me um, in general. And, you know, it was a lot of fun. It was, uh, you know, playing with a half shield for the first time and playing with the pro rules. And, you know, it's an adjustment, but it was an exciting adjustment for me. And, you know, I was, after that camp, you know, I came back home and then I went back, I think late August, early September. And, I was kind of chomping at the bit. I wanted to see what it was all about. I wanted to see how I measured up against, you know, the competition in the league. And, you know, it was, uh, it was an exciting time for me. Was there an adjustment getting used to the people? You think about East Coast people much more direct. And then there's Midwest where we are called nicer. I'm from Minnesota, so we're called nicer. But really, we're just passive aggressive. We just don't say it to your face. We go behind your back and say, oh, that guy, you know, what's he doing? Did you have to get adjusted to that of not having people tell you exactly what they felt right off the hop? See, I thought they actually were just nice. So it worked. No, nope, it's all lies. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, we best guys here. We can tell you it's all lies. Yeah. yeah, it's all lies, I guess. No, I took it as they were nice. No, everybody was any, everyone with the Bucks organization, you know, it, there was a real family feel is the best way that I can uh, explain it. Bob Ferguson was the coach, and he, he personally, my billets when I came into town were actually out of town. So Fergie came and picked me up from the airport. And, you know, that means a lot. That goes a long way. That's going to make – those are the type of things that are going to make – a player want to play for you when you know that that the coach management higher ups care about you as a person and I would say from top to bottom in the Bucks organization that is true and that was something that that stuck out to me about my time in Des Moines when people think about the Buccaneers they think about that arena they think about the fan base and how ravenous those fans are if you've come into that building as an opponent you never had to do it luckily John but I've heard from so many people, it is a terrible place to go in and play if you're the opposing team. But you were on the team, so people were cheering for you, not at you. A lot of guys have a signature fan moment, a chant they remember, a moment they remember in a game where the fans did something they never have seen before. Anything come up to you when I pose that question about remembering the Buccaneer fan base and anything specific? I don't know if there's any one specific moment. For me, it's just the passion that they come. Like you nailed it when you said they come every night, they support. Unfortunately, our team – wins and losses wise we were not a strong team but that did not slow them down and they would show up they would you know cheer for us they were very passionate loud we uh the one memory that just sticks out we won a game against Chicago Steel in the shootout and just the it was it was by and large a meaningless game you know we Chicago is actually kind of in the bottom of the other side of the league and we were on the bottom of our side but we won in a shootout and you would have thought we we were you know, making the playoffs or something, but it's just the, the energy that they bring is infectious. And I think the team 
feeds off that energy and, and, you know, they've, they've had a lot of successful teams. And I think a lot of it stems from that passion that the, that the Des Moines area has for the Bucks. Jack Parker at Boston University wanted you to play juniors for, I'm sure, a bevy of reasons. It's such an important time for hockey players to really take that first step towards becoming the player they hope to be later in life. What changed about John McCarthy in that year? I think year mostly, honestly, the biggest change was I grew up. You know, I was playing in high school. I was living at home. You know, my mom was doing my laundry. My mom was cooking. And, you know, I was pretty much told what to do all the time. I didn't really have to make my own decisions. The biggest thing for me in Des Moines was, okay, you're living with the Billet family who was who were amazing and, and took the time and, and welcomed me into their home. But you know what? You're an adult and you have to figure all this stuff on your own. And I think that bleeds into hockey you know you, you grow up you're more mature you're a better person for it and uh you know that that makes you approach the game you know not not quite as a professional because you still have college but in, in a professional manner where you're treating it as this is you know this is part of the deal this is what i have to do in order to go to college and to play in college i have to treat this like you know it's it's no longer just for fun with my friends it, it should still be fun you should still have fun doing it but, it, but there's a kind of a greater purpose in mind that, that that was the biggest, you know, difference between Des Moines and playing at home. Who are the names that stand out in your mind, whether they be teammates or opponents from when you were in the USHL, guys that you just thought, man, playing with or against this guy is either great or terrible? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Blake Wheeler was in the league at the time. He was with Green Bay. He was very, very strong. Uh, um, we had Chad Rao. He was our strongest player who I actually ended up connecting back with Chad uh, in Worcester. He ended up, he was playing in Des Moines actually for uh, the Minnesota Wilds farm team in Iowa. And he got traded back to Worcester. So I ended up connecting with him, you know, kind of on our pro journeys, which was cool to catch up and, uh, you know, go back and forth with him. Um, Rory Farrell was uh, another Massachusetts guy that was on Des Moines. He was good with me, you know, welcomed me in and, and, uh, you know, made, made me feel a part of the team. So there were, there were numerous, you know, big names and, and high draft picks. And, you know, that's what makes the USHL great is that it's, it's the best competition for a kid that age. Um, the USA teams weren't in the league when I was playing. I know they currently are. And that's just more kind of, of that star power that, that you're referring to. Um, but like I said, it's, it's the competition of the league that sets it apart from the other leagues and, and what draws the fans in and what draws the scouts and, and develops those players to, uh, to, to play at the next level and beyond. Before we transition to Boston University, because there's plenty to talk about there as well, John, want to give you a chance as we close the book on the Buccaneer portion of this podcast, any special message you'd have for the fans? Because as someone who's in this city now working for the team, I know that when we eventually retweet this podcast from the league on our social media. Their fans are going to be jumping on board to listen to this because they remember your name well. Yeah, absolutely. No, I would just like to say thank you. I think, like I said earlier, um, the unwavering passion and support they have for the Bucks in the area is um, amazing. It's amazing to play in front of. It's uh, It feeds into the team's game, I think, as I said. I think, you know, the the team kind of takes the passion of the fans and brings it onto the ice. So I would say that is the, the biggest thing about Des Moines is, is the passion they bring to the, to, the, to the games, to the ice, to the, you know, that's, that's what they pride themselves on, as they should. Um, you know, as far as in the league, they're, they're probably the strongest fan base. And, uh, you know, they should be proud of that. And I would just like to say thank you for the support. And uh, back when I was there in 0405. How do you think the USHL on the ice prepared you for that transition to Boston University and playing college hockey, not only at the division one college level, but in hockey East in an incredible era of hockey out in the hockey East at that time, where do you see your game changing? Where did you see the change? You talked about growing up off the ice, but the jump from prep school to BU much different than the jump from prep school to USHL to hockey East. Yeah, hugely different. Um, I think the USHL, you know, if you had taken the USHL out of my journey, if I had gone straight from high school straight to BU, the adjustment would have been huge as far on ice as far as hockey. I think the year of playing against bigger bodies in the US, USHL, 
as far as playing against better competition, about learning from the coaches that I got in Bob Ferguson and Reg Simon, kind of the different uh, aspects of the game that, you know, I, the high school, uh, my high school experience was great, but, you know, the, the coaches at a, at a higher level have that much more experience and can lead, you know, to give you an introduction to the stuff you're going to see in college. So I think the coaching and, and the competition as far as the size of the guys, the speed of the guys, the skill of the guys was, you know, uh, it was a buffer to get and play at that college level. I think it would have been almost like trying to climb the side of a cliff to go from high school straight to BU. And I think the, the, the year of juniors was made it more of a, you know, a, a hill that was, I was able to climb and able to manage because of my time. When your time at BU, you had a good career your first three years there. You're not necessarily a guy that's mostly known for your points anyway, but your senior year, you just flourished. You had 29 points in 45 games. I mean, that's more than your three-year total before that. Why did you flourish so much in that senior year? Yeah, so my first three years, I was playing on the fourth line. I, I was fourth line center, killing penalties. Um, that's kind of what they brought me in brought me in as I was, uh, you know, not a, not a full scholarship guy as a half scholarship guy. So I knew I was going to, you know, have to find a way into the lineup and find something that I could do that nobody else could do so that the coach couldn't take me out of the lineup. And it turned out to be taking face offs, blocking shots and killing penalties. And that's kind of what I prided myself on. And, you know, Coach Parker uh, is great about giving the seniors, you know, a chance to succeed. So, you know, going into that last year, I was fortunate enough to move up in the lineup and I was playing on the second line with Nick Benino and Brandon Yip, two NHL guys. And, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty easy. Sometimes if you just stand in front of the net, things kind of hit you and go in. So I think that would be the biggest reason why my points uh, increased as they did. But, um, you know, it, it was a, it was a challenge to, uh, to keep doing uh, what I tried to do is, is keep doing those little things that I was doing and, and see if I could add some offense as well. Cause I always, I always believed in myself. I always believed given the chance that I could, you know, contribute offensively and chip in and, you know, I was never going to be the leading scorer, but you know, I, I felt like I could help in that department. And so t to be, to be given that ice time and, and even a little bit of power play time, you know, that, uh, that was a great feeling and, and it was a great year for us as a team. You mentioned players like Nick Benino, one of, many household names on that BU national championship roster your senior season Kevin Shattenkirk Kobe Baker winner Matt Gilroy Colin Wilson the list goes on but you were the guy that wore the C that year you were the leader you were the one that was meeting with Jack Parker with your other captains discussing the challenges discussing the journey of how do we get through this certain struggle that we're in right now, no matter who the team or what your roster looks like, there are challenges a team faces on its way to doing what you did that year. What were those challenges? Yeah, for us, you know, we had a lot of um, what you would call big recruits. We had a lot of high profile kind of first year guys, first round draft picks along the, along the lines of that. So I think the biggest challenge for us was, there's only so much ice time, you know, everybody can't play 20 minutes a night and be on the first power play. And I think the biggest thing for us was, you know, how do we get everybody on board and everybody pulling the rope in the same direction when, you know, some guys might have to take, you know, a little bit of a cut in ice time or, you know, a cut in opportunity and, and how do you keep them on board and keep them, you know, as I said before, pulling in the right direction. I think that was the biggest challenge for us as, Myself and Matt Gilroy were co-captains. Our assistant captain was Brian Strait. Um, that was the biggest thing for us, keeping everybody together and, you know, delivering the message that, like, it, it, you know, it might take a little bit of personal sacrifice, but, you know, at the end of the day, it'll be worth it, you know, if, if everybody buys in and everybody stays the course here. So you end up eventually being a seventh-round pick by the San Jose Sharks in 2006. Now, when you were drafted – Seventh round guy, you know, with, with guys in that late rounds, one, you don't know if you make the National Hockey League, two, you don't know how long you're going to stay with that one team. Did you ever think that you would spend the entirety of your career with the San Jose Sharks organization at that moment? No, I didn't. I, what, I wasn't even expecting to be drafted. It was actually, I think it was the year after what would have been known as my draft year. So it was a year later. I wasn't watching the draft. I was actually at, in my hometown um, hanging out with friends and as I said before the internet was around obviously but not not nearly as prominent and 
I got a text that said something about, you know, congratulations, you shark or something like that. And I didn't even know what they meant. I just kind of brushed it off. I'm like, well, maybe they sent it to the wrong person. I don't know. So then I just kind of just kept hanging out with my friends and, and uh, got another text. And so I was like, what? So we went into the kid's computer whose house I was at and we took a look and then there it was. And, you know, I was honored and I was, was so excited over the top and you know I, I called my parents and told them and my mother thought it meant I had to move to California the next day and she was confused and didn't know what was going on and I said listen I don't really know what's going on either but uh, eventually I got a call from uh, you know the management of the Sharks and uh, they had a little development camp the first year and you know they said listen you know we, we, we like what we see we watched you in Des Moines we watched you at St. John's we watched you it was after my first year at BU um, you know, this is what we want from you. This is where we think you're at. Uh, this is what you need to do, you know, to earn a pro contract. And so, you know, all throughout college, they stayed in touch. Um, and then after my senior year, they offered me a contract, a two-year contract because of my age, um, signed it, went to Worcester, um, actually fell in with a, with two really good line mates my first year. I would say that those two guys were instrumental in my career. Is It was Andrew Desjardins and Dan De Silva. Um, and we, we kind of we kind of became uh, the third line for the team. We kind of started every game. We were an energy line, a checking line. And, you know, we all had personal success because we all played as a line and nobody was really out there to set, set the world on fire number, numbers-wise. So, um, you know, I ended up getting one call up that year. The second year I played uh, a bunch in the NHL, went for five years. Um, it kind of ran its course after five years. You know, I, I, had, I had earned a couple of contracts and I had played some NHL games. I think the Sharks didn't see me as a full-time NHLer. Um, I felt like I maybe I should take an opportunity somewhere else and see if I can make the NHL full-time. So I actually ended up signing with St. Louis. Um, went to camp with them, got cut out of camp, went to the Chicago Wolves, um, played in the Chicago Wolves until around uh, December. And then they actually ended up trading me back to Worcester. So it was that it was 10, 10 plus years, but there was a little interruption there. Uh, but everything came back and that saved my career. To be honest, I was struggling in Chicago. I was struggling with St. Louis and, you know, I wasn't playing great, wasn't playing much. And uh, Worcester brought me back in and, and honestly gave me another five years that I don't, I'm not so sure I would have had if I had not gone back. So uh, to answer your question, no, I, w I did not expect what ended up happening. So you're get drafted by San Jose. You said your mom was panicking that you had to move to California, but when did it click? Well, wait, there are affiliates in Worcester and you can go right down the street. That had to be a really cool situation where you're drafted by a California team, but you're pretty much playing in your backyard. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, and, and to be honest, I, I approached the whole thing, you know, I got, I knew I got drafted. I knew I was a late pick, you know, I'm like, listen, this is this is insane. I never thought I was going to get drafted to the NHL. I was never on any draft boards. I was never included in that. So I was approaching it like, listen, I'm going to worry about BU. I'm going to worry about playing my game and doing the best I can. And if it happens down the road, if they sign me, they sign me. I'm not, you know, going to be asking them every five games, you know, what do you think? I, I was worried about my time at BU being a good teammate, playing my game there. And then if things worked out, they worked out, which they ended up working out. And as you said, that is that was an exciting thing for me was that, you know, even when I turned pro, my parents would be able to, it was a 45 minute drive for them. They could come to every game. And, uh, you know, it was, it was just a nice thing that it wasn't a huge adjustment for me to go from BU right down the road to Worcester. So you said you never expected to be an NHL draft pick, which means you probably really never expected to play in the Olympics uh, for Team USA, which seemingly has been your career. You've continued to surprise yourself in a lot of ways. 2018 comes around in Pyeongchang, South Korea. The NHL is not sending players, but they are sending AHL players. John McCarthy packs up his bags and gets onto the ice in Pyeongchang, South Korea, to play a game of hockey, nonetheless, for Team USA. That moment for you, was there a time that you think back on skating around wearing the red, white, and blue thinking, how did I ever get here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, again, it was kind of the same situation. I don't want to keep portraying myself as this underdog, but it, it actually ended up happening. They, they kind of had a team picked and they played in a, in a tournament 
um, like a like a preliminary tournament over in Germany. And the coaches came out of that. Tony Granato was the head coach. They came out of that kind of with the thought that they could use a bottom line guy that could take some face offs and maybe kill some penalties. So they were kind of on the lookout for that. The other side of the story is Tony Granato played in San Jose and coached with a lot of the guys that are in San Jose. So there was kind of a backdoor connection there. And those guys went to bat for me, which I'll never forget. You know, they went out of their way to vouch for me, call Tony, tell him, you know, you should come take a look at this kid. So Tony came to watch me play, decided that I was, you know, the puzzle piece that they were looking for. And, uh, you know, it, it was just amazing. It was an amazing experience. My whole family got to come. My now wife came. Um, they got to watch me play. As far as a moment that, that stuck out to me, it was just kind of putting the jersey on for that first time. The thing that was different about me was, you know, a lot of the kids on that team played for, you know, those festival teams or the under-18 team, or they've worn that jersey before. I never have. I never, I never made any of those teams or even tried out for them, really. So, uh you know, that was a really cool moment. Picture day was the first day I was able to put the jersey on. But just walking out to the first game against Slovenia, it's just kind of like, whoa, this is, you know, this is pretty cool. Throughout your career, John, there's a common thread. It's like you talked about earlier, you found a way to be valuable to your organization, whether that was the Des Moines Buccaneers or the Boston University Terriers or the San Jose Sharks, you found a way to add value. And I think about players growing up that all want to be the guy on sports center top 10 that are making TSN's top 10, but you found a way to carve out an incredible career, 577 AHL games, 88 NHL games, an Olympic uh, tournament, all because you found a way to be important. What would you tell players that are growing up that, are trying to find their way through all of what you found your way through that are going to likely come to a point where they say, I can't be the most skilled player on the team anymore. It just, it depends on when, right? It, whether it's in prep hockey or junior hockey or college hockey or pro hockey, everybody for the most part, minus Sidney Crosby, Alex Ovechkin, et cetera, come to that point. What would you tell players that are asking that question of where do I find my niche? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. That's a great point because it does happen for almost every player at some point. And a lot of times it happens organically. A lot of times they they want to play a skill game. They want to be the most skilled guy and it's just not working. And it's like, well, you're going to have to do something else. You're going to add something to your game here or else you're not going to make this team. So I think that's the biggest thing. And I, and I think the, the other biggest thing is just being open to to changing. You know, it's – very, 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 like you just said, the upper echelon of NHL guys, like the percentage of being one of those players. By all means, I hope kids strive to be those players. I will, they should. But I think there comes a point where, you know what, there's a lot of other puzzle pieces onto a team where that can bring value and it can help teams win. And, you know, I think it's about having the right coaches, having the right mentors to say, hey, listen, why don't we work on this? You can add this to your game. That way, if you're not one of the highest skilled, if you're not scoring 50 goals a year, you know, you're still going to have value. You're still going to be in the lineup every night because you can do these things better than other players can. And that's the biggest thing is, is relying on good people around you to, to give you good advice and also, you know, being open to making those adjustments to your game. We hinted at it earlier on the show, talking about the end of the season this year for you, which came early for everybody, but also came earlier than most for you with the heart condition. You went from sitting on the bench to standing behind the bench with the San Jose Barracuda in the AHL. How has that process been for you? Players often like to believe they will get to make the decision. Okay. I've had my career. I'm going to move on. You unfortunately didn't get to do that. You had to be told that I have to be done now. How was that process? How has that transition been for you during, I'm sure what's been a very difficult time with, with that being told to you? Yeah. You know, like, like we said, um, with the, with the coronavirus, the, the overall season ended abruptly. And that's also true for me. Mine, mine ended very abruptly. So I, yeah, it was tough. It was a tough time for me. You know, um, it's always hard when, when something like that comes to, comes to uh, an end, kind of not on your terms but you know discussing it with a lot of hockey people very few very very few players get to walk away from the game you know 
after having won the big, like in the movies, they win the big game and they walk away on their own terms and everybody's happy. That, that hardly ever happens. So, you know, going into this season, I was 33 years old and, you know, the AHL is a younger league. Now the, I think the second oldest guy on my team was 24. Mm -hmm. So there was a big age gap anyway. And, and, you know, I was approaching it as one year, I was on one year contracts, just minor league contracts. Um, I was approaching it as one year at a time and, you know, keeping my options open for what I could do after. Um, you know, I always made sure in the summers to uh, stay in touch with with guys I played with in the past or kids I grew up with that work, you know, in the area now and I'll go in and visit their offices and everything to, to make sure I, I knew kind of what everything entailed and what different different prof professions would would uh, involve. Um, so but w when it happened, you know, uh, uh, they told me I'd, I'd have to be on blood thinners for a little while. And I wouldn't be able to play. And, you know, I, I got to give the Sharks credit. They were great with me. They were absolutely unbelievable. Said, take it, take some time. You know, I, I actually came home here. It was right around Christmas time. I came home for a couple of weeks to spend time with family and talk to people I, I trusted, whose opinion I trusted. And, you know, came to the conclusion that, you know what, this is kind of a, it's kind of a clean break. It's kind of, you know, things were we're winding down anyway, not to say I couldn't have pulled out another year or two, maybe I could, but you know what, that's life. And, and I'm a big believer in, you know, you can't really control what happens to you, but you can control how you react to it. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, the stroke happened to me and all I can control is how, how am I going to bounce back from this? And, uh, you know, the sharks were, were unbelievable, like I said, and, and uh, offered me an, uh, an opportunity to stay, stay along with the team in a coaching role. And, uh, you know, stay close to the game. And that was the biggest thing for me was that I care about the game and I, I care about the guys in that locker room. And, you know, that was the biggest uh, reason for me to, to, to accept, you know, the, the position. And, and I did, and it was an adjustment at first, the coaching, you know, it's different than playing. You spend a lot more time at the rink, a lot more video work. Um, but, but I enjoyed it. Like I said, it's, I, I was able to stay close to the game and, and uh, you know, it gave me an opportunity kind of change things now instead of, you know, getting the excitement over a goal or an assist or winning a game, you know, now I'm excited for the guys that do that. And, and I genuinely want those guys to make the NHL. They're good kids. They work hard. I want them to have the opportunity to move to the next level. So, um, you know, it's, it's the, uh, I guess the, the goal has changed, but, you know, uh, I still love being close to the game. San Jose extends you that olive branch with the coaching opportunity. Is that just something that you got to do because you could transition to it easily? Or do you think this might be the second chapter of the hockey career of John McCarthy? I'd like it to be, you know, I think there's a lot up in the air right now with everything going on and, and everything's kind of uncertain. Um, I would like for it to be a second career. I, I truly, truly believe that I have something to offer the the kids and 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 I I would love the opportunity to do that like I said I, I want it for them like I don't I'm not really doing it for for I mean don't get me wrong it's a great job I love it but you know it, it's not about me anymore it's about them and and I and I hope my message comes across that way because that is that's genuine that's that's how I feel um but yeah, it's, uh, I'd like it to be a second career. I would like to stick with it and uh, kind of see where it can take me. Um, but I guess kind of only time will tell. Last question for you here. So you're an NCAA national champion. You've represented the U.S. in the Olympics. You've played in the NHL. You've been a captain for the, an AHL team and played almost 600 games. What is the one thing that you remember most about your playing career and you're most proud of? Wow, that's tough come up with one that's tough um honestly i would say the big i mean the first i'll, I'll do like a couple of runner-ups the, the playing in the olympics putting on the usa jersey was awesome playing your first nhl game was a feeling like unparalleled um but but i think the entire season of my senior year of college when the team came together and just the chemistry we had as a team as a whole was was amazing to experience it was like I said, there were issues along the way. There were bumps along the way. There were personalities to manage. But, you know, we all came together when it counted the most, and we persevered, and we won it together as a team. And that, to me, would be the highlight of my career. It always makes me smile when those questions get asked to players that have achieved like you've achieved, John, and have so much individual accolades they could talk to. But 
so oftentimes you hear the players say it's about a team experience. It's about the guys. It's about coming together as a group. So I'm not surprised that that was your answer at all, John, based off the conversation that we've had today. Well, if you got anything else to add, John, we'll give you the floor. But otherwise, this has been a fantastic chat. I've really enjoyed it. And I know I speak for Chris and, uh, and Brent listening as well. This has been uh, another great chapter of our show. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, guys. I, you know, I, I loved my time in the USHL. Love, love the city of Des Moines. And uh, again, I'd like to thank the fans from Des Moines for all they did for me. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. That'll do it for another great interview. Thanks to John for joining us on the U Show podcast. An incredible story, if you think about it. I mean, the loyalty this guy has to the Sharks organization with the exception of a few games in Chicago before he was just traded right back to the Sharks, Sharks organization. Just a great guy. And if you don't learn something from that podcast, there's something off with you, I think. I mean, that, that was inspiring, you could say, on a lower level, um, just on what he had to say and what he's done in his career, considering all the circumstances. Completely agree. And sure sounds like he has all of the intangibles to become a great coach. So I'm really excited to watch where the career of John McCarthy pivots to now. Uh, we mentioned it before we played the interview, how successful of a career he really has had, even if you look at it from an outside perspective and say, oh, well, he was just a career AHL guy. But no, there's no taking away what he's done for his playing career. And now from a coaching perspective, I would expect no different from John McCarthy and the fact that this guy is going to find himself a niche and he's going to deliver success on the ice from behind the bench, even though he used to do it from on the ice himself. Yeah. I mean, him coming a coach now, if you don't have respect for that guy, when he talks, I mean, I don't know, you know, what, who you're ever going to respect, right? Like that guy's a wealth of knowledge and you know, the term I use maybe too much, he's a credible human being. So he deserves everything he's gotten in the hockey world and is going to receive moving forward for sure. Don't want to forget to thank Nick Nolenberger with the San Jose Barracuda for the assist on that interview. We always got to look out for the PR guys because you and I have both done it. I still do it. You do it in some way, shape, and form for the USHL. So you can't forget about the PR guys. Those guys do a lot of work for yeah. those teams, don't they? Especially at, in certain organizations if, you know, they have smaller staffs than others. It's, mm -hmm. it's crazy and people don't realize um, they're, they're the John McCarthy's of the, the staff. Well done. Well done. <laughs> the Swiss army knife of yes. uh, an organization is a PR guy. It might not make the big sales. It makes everybody smile and happy, but a lot of hard work and sleepless nights and thankless efforts go into that. So thanks to you, all of our PR guys that have ever helped us for sure. Anything else? That's all I got. Man, a Bucks guy. You really didn't talk about it in the second half. We've said it all. We've said it all. <laughs> hey, hey, what <laughs> do you say? Let's see. go Bucks. That's all I got to say. R. R. Yeah, again, R. You can do it every buck we have on here now. Yeah. Some kind I'm, of swash, swashbuckling comment. I'm just going to make awkward pirate yeah. analogies and <laughs> puns and comments. But really, in the last two, all, all I've just said is R. Yes. It'll, so, it'll get more creative as we go on. Yeah. Well, thanks to John McCarthy. Thanks to Ben Gesselson. Thanks to Brent Meske, as always. I'm Chris Trepp, and this was the U Show Podcast. <laughs> This is the You Show Podcast.